Welcome to Business Authority Radio, bringing you insights from today's thought leaders, professionals, and influencers with your hosts, Neil Howe and Craig Williams. Hello and welcome to the show. This is your host, Neil Howe, and I have a very special guest today, Dr. Irene Davis. Um, she is a physical therapist and she has quite the education. Uh, I'm going to let that speak for itself. Um, but she has been educated in multiple universities. Let's see, we've got the University of Massachusetts, University of Florida, Pennsylvania State University, and I think there is another one in there as well. I'll let uh, Dr. Davis uh, give us a little bit of her background and how she got started in physical therapy. So welcome to the show, Dr. Irene Davis. Thank you, Neil. It's great to be here. So um, just for a little bit of background, I started out uh, in exercise science. Um, and like many people in physical therapy, I was a physically active person and was fascinated with the human body and loved the idea of, you know, somehow applying this to medicine. Thought about medicine and being a physician, but really wanted to to spend the time, more time with my patients as, as physical therapists do. So um, I finished my uh, undergrad in exercise science and went to the University of Florida in Gainesville and got a degree in physical therapy. And uh, I started out in, um, believe it or not, spinal cord rehab, which is very far from what I'm doing now. Um, worked with, in a rehab setting, uh, was Woodrow Wilson Rehab Center that was in Virginia. Um, working, as I said, sp specifically with spinal cord injury, but also with brain injury and prosthetics. So I did that for a couple of years, a few years, and I think I always knew I was going to go back to school, and I was fascinated with biomechanics. So I, I, um, I was close to UVA at the time. That's the school that you were trying to think of. That's the other school. Mm -hmm. um, and I did, my master, I did a master's in biomechanics there and then went on to do my PhD in biomechanics with Dr. Peter Kavanaugh, who happened to be one of the pioneers in the biomechanics of running. Um, and that's sort of what got me off onto that direction. And uh, after that, I, I was at the University of Delaware for 21 years uh, in a faculty position. And um, in the last five years, I've been here at the Spalding National Running Center, which I founded and I'm directing um, within the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at Harvard Medical School. Well, that is definitely quite the resume um, <laughs> to have so many degrees uh, is absolutely excellent. You obviously know your stuff, but you really have uh, specialized uh, now. Tell us what your focus is and what you've been doing your research on. Sure. So um, I have been studying the um, biomechanics that are affiliate, they're associated with running injuries. Um, and that's really how I started my career. You know, as I said, Peter Kavanaugh was a pioneer in understanding the mechanics of, of running. And I came as a clinician um, and said, look, I'm really interested in applying these mechanics to clinical problems. So, you know, I had one foot in biomechanics and the science and one foot in the clinical area. And, um, and that was really kind of what got me started um, in terms of, of you know, the direction that I had um, in studying run runners. So I, I started my career at the University of Delaware and spent the first, probably the first half of my time there studying how, what mechanics are associated with, with different kinds of injuries that runners sustain. These are typically overused musculoskeletal injuries. And then I started to think about, well, well, now that we understand that some of these mechanics do play a role, what do we do about it? And at that point, I took my my scientific hat off, I put my clinical hat back on, and I said, we've got to be able to retrain those gait patterns if we believe that these mechanics are, you know, leading to injury. And so I spent um, a number of years coming up with uh, their biomechanical interventions um, to retrain gait patterns using motor control principles so that we could mitigate some of these biomechanical factors that were associated with injuries. So, so, so that's how I got started, sort of, and, and, and so have really spent 
all of my career really studying lower extremity mechanics and injuries. So a lot of our listeners are entrepreneurs and they, you know, really have a lot of hours in their business, but they also spend that time exercising and working out and running obviously is one of those main activities to get that cardiovascular work in. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the mechanics of running an injury. What kind of problems uh, come up for runners? So um, I think that our problems, this is my, uh, this is maybe a little more philosophical answer to your question, but I really believe that a lot of our problems go back to the fact that we are not running in the way that we were adapted to run. And, and by that, I mean that, you know, we've been running for 2 million years now since uh, Homo erectus emerged. And, and we, uh, there's, there's some hypotheses that you know, we really evolved to run. Um, our bodies have changed and adapted in ways like long Achilles tendons, for example, and arches in our feet um, that were different in Homo erectus who ran and from Australopithecus are the um, before that who did not run. And so, you know, if you think about the fact that we were actually adapted to run and that we needed to run and that running is in a sense imprinted in our genes, then it doesn't seem to make sense that we should be getting injured at such a high rate. And that really got me thinking about what was happening um, in terms of this high injury rate. Um, clearly, it's, it's going to be multifactorial, but um, there's a, a theory called the mismatch theory of evolution that states that we're, our bodies are not changing as quickly as the environment around us is. Um, because it takes a very, 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 and I don't know exactly how long, but probably millions of years for our bodies to make these adaptations. And yet our environment, especially post-industrial rev revolution, um, has changed very quickly. And so there's this mismatch. Um, and from a global sense, um, the evolutionary biologists will say that, um, suggest that many of the diseases that we're dying from today, the, uh, the non-communicable diseases such as diabetes and you know, heart disease and obesity and some of those things um, are really because we are not using our bodies in the way that they were adapted. So we're not moving the way that we should. We all know that sitting is the new smoking. Um, we used to be much more active in our daily activities. Um, and yet, you know, our bodies really haven't had a chance to adapt. So for example, if if we um, if our metabolisms over this period of time also increased while our activity level decreased, then maybe we wouldn't have the obesity levels that we have, but we don't make those kinds of adaptations that quickly. And so there's an extension of this um, to running, and that is that we were adapted to run um, without shoes, right? And not mm -hmm. that we should all be barefoot now, but that you know we, we actually um, ran most of our evolutionary history in no shoes or, or shoes that were just fabricated out of whatever we could find in the environment to protect the bottom of our feet. And, and when you run without shoes, you don't land on the, on the heel, you land on the ball of your foot. Um, and if you try it, go out and try to run barefoot and really land on your heel, it will likely hurt. And it doesn't, again, make sense to run in a way that, you know, would be painful. And so, um, once we started to have the running boom of the 70s and, and we also started to, to uh, have footwear and shoes that actually added cushioning to our heel, it became comfortable for us to land on our heel. Um, and so people started landing more on their heel. And, and it's clear there's lots of evidence that shows that when you take people's shoes off and have them run, they don't land on their heel if you give them time to habituate to that. And uh, people, 90% of people in traditional shoes do land on their heel. So what, what does that all have to do with injury, you might ask? Well, I think um, what happens when you land on your heel is you um, introduce this impact, this very quick, abrupt force to your body that you don't have when you land on the ball of the foot. And ours and others' uh, research has shown that that, that very abrupt force 
is related to the development of a number of musculoskeletal injuries. So um, I, I really think that a lot of the injuries that we have today actually go back to the mismatch theory of evolution. Um, it's an interesting idea and one that, um, you know, I've been thinking about and talking to some of my colleagues who are evolutionary biologists about. And um, I think that <clears throat> if we could, you know, maybe return back closer to the way that we were adapted to run. Also, it's why people feel like they need to get out and run because, or exercise, because we're not getting it during the day. I mean, you think about before the Industrial Revolution, people didn't, I mean, they were so active in their, in their work and their jobs, and they weren't sitting and, you know, all day long. And so, you know, they didn't need to replace this activity. But now, because we don't have that activity level, we have to find ways to replace that activity. Right. There wasn't really such a thing as a, an exercise phenomenon. They were just out exercising all day, every day, whether it was farming or uh, working, whatever job that they were doing. Absolutely. Um, so, but and now we have, like you said, we exercise in like short bursts. You know, it's 30 minutes at the gym or we go out for right. a 30, 40 minute run. And, you know, what does that have any... Um, benefits to us or like they say 30 minutes uh, three times a week for the heart or what pro problems is that causing you know with injuries and uh, structural issues well i think from the cardiovascular standpoint there's lots of good evidence that demonstrates that if we um engage in moderate activity and that doesn't have to be running it could be biking it could be really brisk walking um, but if we do that yeah you know, 30 minutes five times a week that we significantly reduce our risk for cardiovascular types of disorders. And then if we double that to an hour, five times a week, we further reduce that. There is a, there is a point of diminishing returns, you know, we don't want to overdo it, but so I think there's good evidence for that. Mm. Our, so what I was just going to say is that our, we are, because we are adapted to run because running was something we needed to do to survive. I believe running is an activity of daily living. You don't have to be taught how to run. You learn, you, you just automatically develop that motor skill, just like walking. And you, as a child, you learn to run without someone telling you how to do it. And it's something that you need. You might have to run across the street. You may have to run after your toddler. You may have to run away from the bear. So I think it's something that is one of the most natural forms of exercise that we have and that we're set up probably really well, not probably, we are set up really well to do this activity. The problem is that when we start imposing forces we weren't, you know, adapted for, um, and we uh, often exercise in a way that we weren't adapted for. So doing too much, too quick, too soon, certainly that can increase the risk for injury. Mm. So I want to get back to the gates, but I, I want, I was fascinated. I've got a little bit of a exercise physiology background myself. And one of my favorite classes was learning about the gait and how, you know, the whole mechanics of the, the, the walking step uh, works. I thought it was really interesting, but when you're walking, you land on your heel, right? You absolutely do. And you're supposed to, um, you know, walking and running are two very different activities and they're modeled differently from a biomechanical standpoint. So walking is often modeled as an inverted pendulum. So just going from step to step to step. And so your center of mass actually goes up as you step and then it goes down. Whereas when you run, it's modeled as a mass spring where your center mass goes down as you step onto that leg and then goes up. So they're very different activities from a mechanical standpoint. Hmm. Well, let's talk about some of the injuries that occur from running. Obviously, sure. there's, there's more impact uh, when you're hitting the ground and especially on your heel rather than... Uh, the front of your foot. So what injuries do people get if they're avid runners? So the most common site for injury is the knee um, and anterior knee pain. So patellofemoral pain is one of the most common. Um, IT band syndrome is also common. Um, and the knee is the 
largest attenuator of shock. You know, it's, it's where you attenuate your shock with every foot strike. So there's a lot of load that goes to the knee. Um, but the knee is not the only place that we have injuries. They're, they're primarily from the knee down in terms of the most prevalent. So there's the knee, you can have tibial stress fractures, you can have metatarsal stress fractures, Achilles tendonitis, plantar fasciitis. Um, so these are some of the most common um, types of injuries. Um, further up, you can certainly have femoral neck stress fractures. You can certainly have, you know, hip pain and bursitis and some of those things that, that follow along um, more proximally. But, uh, you know, when you think about it, you know, the foot actually is the first thing that comes in contact with the ground. So it's also going to be at risk. And, and um, that's why I think it's more prevalent that you see these injuries from the knee down where the, the loads are the highest or the shock is the highest. Your body is a, it's a large shock attenuator. So when you land on the ground, um, it's, if you're running at about an eight minute per mile pace, you're at the shock at your tibia, the tibial acceleration, acceleration is really what shock is. Um, and it's measured in G's. That um, is about six to eight G's um, normally when you're running about an eight to 10 minute per mile pace. And when it gets to your head, because this is a wave, shock wave that travels all the way up to your head. So when it gets to your head, it has to be about between one or two Gs um, so that you don't, you know, vibrate your brain too much. Um, and so no matter what you start out with, when it gets to your head, it's usually, it's one to, between one to two Gs. So the larger the shock that you, you start with, the more it has to be attenuated through your body. Right? And it gets attenuated all the way up. So the shock wave is the largest at the foot. And then is it, you know, the knee attenuates it, the hip attenuates it. You even attenuate it through your spine and through your neck as it goes up to your head. But the, the knee is one of the largest shock attenuators. So I think this is, you know, in part why it takes, it, you know, it, it ends up being one of the areas that is more highly injured. When you have lower shock to begin with, think about that. There's less shock attenuation and dampening that your, your body has to do. And so if you go from a rear foot strike to a forefoot strike, for example, you cut that um, tibial shock in about half. So you're starting with less. It's a softer landing. And the reason it's a softer landing is because you're attenuating the load through that calf. So your calf and that long Achilles, which is designed to store and return energy, um, does the the work that say your quadriceps and your knee would have to do if you are landing on your heel? Mm, this is fascinating stuff. It really gets me thinking about how I run and <laughs> and how I walk and the the different things that I am doing wrong. Um, now, as far as the solutions to the problem. You say that when we run, we land on our heels instead of the front foot, but there's a whole industry out there with shock absorbent shoes. How are we to combat all this education and that uh, money that goes into that industry that says, these are the shoes you need because it gives you the, the support. What would you recommend as far as shoes for a runner? Oh, well, I think you're absolutely right that it's a big uphill battle because for some reason, as time has gone on, we've lulled ourselves into thinking that our feet um, are unable to tolerate the loads of running and that we need to cushion them and we need to control them and support them. But if you think about it, we came into this world with the ability to walk and run without anything on our feet. Our feet, we have 26 bones, 33 articulations, four layers of arch muscles. Um, and so the foot is really well designed to attenuate the loads and to support the foot and, uh, during walking and running. And so when you look at the footwear, prior to the 1970s, they were minimal. Their shoes that had, you know, some type of an outer sole, maybe a canvas upper, different kind of leather upper. They had very, they had no midsole. They had no arch supports in them. They had no heel counters, very little heel counters in them. 
Um, and so, and we've been running actually that way for 2 million years. So when you think about this technology that has been um, added to footwear, it's only been in the last five decades. And some people will argue, well, it's, you know, we need this footwear because now we're running on hard surfaces. But when I speak to my evolutionary biologists, we ran on some very hard pack surfaces, the hard pack savanna. And, um, you know, we have innately in us the ability to adjust the leg spring. So the stiffness of our leg, either making it stiff or compliant, depending on the surface that we come in contact with. So when you run on soft surfaces, you stiffen your leg. And when you run on hard surfaces, you make your leg more compliant. You think about it, if you were gonna jump off a table onto a concrete surface, you would land as soft as you could. You'd bend your knees, your ankles. But if you're landing in sand, you're gonna stiffen up. It's just an automatic um, a reaction that you have uh, to the surface that you come in contact with. So if you take a highly cushioned shoe and put it you know, on the bench and test it with an impactor, it will attenuate the load, no doubt. But when you put it between the ground and a human, um, now you have this interaction of a neuromuscular system that's going to adapt to it. And so there are studies, and there are a number of studies now, that have shown that people actually land softer when they're landing with less cushioning. Mm. But you've got to train your, you do have to train your body to be able to do that. So you wouldn't want to take someone who was used to running in some highly cushioned shoes and used to kind of being lazy and pounding their, you know, their heel into the ground because they've got this cushioning. You wouldn't want to take that person and put them into a pair of minimal shoes because they haven't developed the capacity to, um, to be able to cushion that landing, at least not for any length of time. They might be able to do it for a short period of time, but it takes endurance. It takes adaptation to be able to, to do that. But if we started everybody that way, if we started our kids that way, think about this, how much stronger their feet and their lower extremities would be. Yeah, that was actually my next question is how do we transition from, you know, uh, since the 70s, you know, myself growing up, it's really all I knew were these cushion shoes and landing on the heel. How am I going to get retrained now in my 40s to start running on the forefoot? Well, we do this every day at the Spalding National Running Center. We've had over 500 runners come through our center um, of all ages. And sometimes as we age, I don't think you're old, but we've done people in their 50s and 60s. We've treated them um, and been able to transition them. So, you know, you can adapt. The body is incredibly adaptable. It takes some time and patience, which a lot of runners don't have, as you, you know. Um, but I think it can be done at this age. But I also think that, um, we need to rethink footwear, and I think it's a very big issue. I think we need to rethink our feet. Um, we published a paper uh, with um, uh, some I did with some colleagues, uh, Pat McKeon, Jay Hertel, Dennis Bramble, myself, um, really thinking about the arch of the foot being the core of the foot, very similar to the core, the lumbo pelvic core that we all think about and how we all know how important that having good stable core is for normal motion and reducing injury risk. Well, if your arch, if the arch of your foot is not stable, then when you're starting to push off, the arch is going to collapse and you're not going to have a good rigid lever to push off on. So, you know, in order to adapt to this footwear, you've got to, you can't just put your feet that have been supported and coddled all your life into this footwear and just run in it. So we have a program where we actually help people to strengthen their feet, strengthen the core of their feet, do it progressively, um, and then and then transition them into the minimal footwear. But if we took our kids and did that right from the get go, then there wouldn't be a transition. And that's really my my vision. Uh, and is there a product out there for kids, or is it just training? to run on the forefoot or are there special shoes designed uh, in order for that to be more prev prevalent to run the correct way? Uh, well, so I think that let's just say if everyone were barefoot, I think mm -hmm. the majority of people would run on the ball of their foot. There was a paper by Dan Lieberman looking at, these were people in Kenya, 
and he had people who were mostly shot all the time that were shot all the time. Then he had people who were mostly shot, people who were shot and barefoot and people who are barefoot all the time. So four different groups of people. And what he found is that the people who are always barefoot when they ran, they ran on the ball of their foot. The people who are always shot when they ran, ran on their heel. So, you know, I think keeping kids, Letting kids be barefoot, I think, is also an important, just all the sensory input that you get and allowing the feet to move the way they're, they're, they need to be moving. Um, and then, you know, I think that's going to help to promote that kind of strike pattern, but also getting them in shoes that don't put cushioning on their heel so that it's uncomfortable for them to land on their heel. It promotes that kind of a, a pattern. Um, and the kinds of shoes, I mean, there are lots of shoes that, are don't cost a lot of money so there are some of the shoe companies the minimal shoe companies um, can be somewhat expensive for kids i mean they're good for adults but kids grow out of shoes so quickly that i recommend parents get get kids in a pair of you know inexpensive um canvas like keds something that just basically protects the bottom of their feet and let their feet develop there was a study done and this is back in 1992 2,300 Indian children, meaning from India, um, from three different communities. One part of that, one community went completely barefoot. Another community, they wore primarily closed-toed shoes. And then the third community, they wore open-toed sandals. And they looked at the prevalence of flat-footedness. Now, conventional wisdom would say that you need to support the arch so that it doesn't fall. I mean, this is what I was taught as a young physical therapist. Um, but what they found in the study is that flat-footedness was least prevalent in the barefoot kids and most prevalent in the kids that wore shoes. So what does that tell us? That maybe we need to be rethinking. You know, we would not put a neck brace on our, uh, you know, a neck brace on us for life to support our neck because what would happen? Those muscles would not function correctly. You'd, you know, you'd lose the stability of those neck musculature, even a back brace. You know, you want to do that temporarily while somebody maybe is is in acute pain but you want to try to get them out of that as physical therapists as quickly as possible and yet we believe for some reason that we've got to put people in these supportive shoes and orthotics we haven't even touched on that topic but mm. you know orthotics for life and and i i used to think that way that's what's interesting is that i've i've changed my thinking about that with some of the research we've done and just, you know, other people's research and sort of it kind of came together a bit like a perfect storm for me. And it just sort of fit that we really should be allowing the foot just like any other part of the body. We need to be strengthening those four layers of arch muscles, not, not just supporting them. Well, it really is amazing that, you know, we have all this science and technology that tells us to do one thing. And then, you know, we, really really look into it and we end up going back to being as natural and as simple as possible uh, the body certainly is an amazing thing and it doesn't uh, need a great deal of help in the form of running shoes or anything like that so dr irene what would you suggest would be the one thing that people could do right now especially the runners to help prevent them getting uh, injuries from their daily runs? Well, I think probably the most simple advice that I can give to people is to listen to their bodies and not do too much too quick too soon. Um, because I think overdoing it, uh, while we were adapted to run and running's imprinted in our genes, I don't think we were adapted to run 26 miles on a hard, flat surface in one direction. And it's not going to ever stop marathons or ultramarathons. Well, ultramarathons are often done on trails, which I think is great running. Um, but, you know, I think that sometimes we, you know, if you think about mismatch, I think that that is not that's a mismatch from the way that we adapt. We were adapted to chase animals. This is why we needed to run. We had to chase our, hunt our food down. So we were running many directions and stopping and going. And so, 
I think overuse in terms of overtraining is probably one of the most common causes of injuries. And I think that people just need to listen to their bodies. Um, I think varying your training, um, running on trails, trails are great because you don't load the body in the same way. You're, you know, you're, and you're probably changing your foot strike pattern up a lot. Even if you're in a pair of regular shoes, sometimes you got to jump over things and, you know, avoid roots and things like that. And it helps to develop your proprioception. So I, I think that running in trails, at least using that um, uh, as a, an adjunct to your, to your road running is also very helpful in help reducing injuries and injury risk. Excellent. Well, we've been listening with Dr. Irene Davis. She is the founding director of the Spalding National Running Center. Uh, tell me, Dr. Davis, what is your next uh, big project or what is the next goal at the Spalding National Running Center? Well, we're, you know, we're hoping to help to provide more and more evidence for the um, utilization of minimal footwear and strengthening feet as opposed to conventional footwear um, and landing on your heel. Um, wanting to look at that in terms of how that uh, affects the, the musculoskeletal system of the foot. So does, do people's feet really get stronger? Do muscles get bigger? Do bones get stronger when we, you know, use our feet the way they're, they're meant to be used? Um, and then what does that, what kind of role does that play in injuries? And we're also very interested in trying to understand if what the effect is if we can get this footwear on children. Mm. Uh, like I said, this is fascinating stuff for me and I want to know more. So how is the best way for me to do that? Do we, can I access some of your research or what's the best way to contact you or your website? Yeah, we have a website. It's um, www.snrc.org. Run, sorry, run snrc.org. Um, and so we have a lot of information on that website and um, certainly uh, some of the references are on there as well. Well, Dr. Irene Davis, thank you very much for the great information that you have given us today. It was uh, extremely interesting and you know i know a lot of people out there listening to this um really thinking about uh the things that you said and how they're running and the shoes they're wearing and hopefully it will make a difference to the injuries that are occurring as well so thank you very much for being on the business authority radio show all right thank you neil for having me on it's been a pleasure and to our listening audience, if you like what you hear, hit that like button and share, and we'll see you next time on the show. You've been listening to Business Authority Radio with Neil Howe and Greg Williams. To learn more about the resources mentioned in today's show or to listen to past episodes, visit businessauthorityradio.com.